Right. Thanks, Candice. So uh, today we're going to talk about Linux kernel debugging. Um, I, so my name is Joel Fernandez. I'm uh, one of the uh, maintainers of of the kernel. I, I maintain the I co-maintain the R RCU subsystem, which is a core kernel subsystem. And I've been uh, developing, uh, working on the kernel for about like 13 years now. I currently work at uh, Google. So, um, just to uh, just to mention, uh, you know, there's nothing confidential in any of these slides. All the information is public. All the code is open source. Uh, but uh, you know, do your own research, and you know, uh, don't take anybody for, for their word on anything. And and definitely double check and and uh, you know, do your research and uh, and uh, before you try anything. So. Uh, Kernel debug. So let's let's uh, talk briefly about about kernel debugging, like an introduction. So, uh, in my experience, there is no magic formula. It usually requires some creative, like detective type of work. Uh, it requires like like uh, you know some imagination, uh, you know, because problems are very different. Different problems have required different tools and different like ideas and stuff like that. So you have to you have to have a very uh, you have to focus on on creativity and imagination quite a lot. Like Mark Twain says, you can depend on your eyes when your imagination is out of focus. So you you need to have some imagination as well, and you know, uh, you know, have that attitude of trying different things. Uh, so the talk is this talk is not about create the the creative part of the detective work though. It's it's more about what's available and the choice is yours. So, you know, as Steve Jobs said, uh, you know. Uh, he said that you cannot connect the dots looking forward. You can only connect them looking backward. And so, and so you have to trust that the dots will somehow connect in, in your future. So I, uh, I take that quite seriously because like, you know, for me, like, it's like I, ne I need to uh, accumulate enough dots so that I can connect them. And so that's what this talk is going to focus on is we're going to focus on those dots and what's available out there. We won't be covering too much of intro level software debugging uh, introduction kind of stuff, but more like focusing on on the on the actual tools and the and the dots as well. And we'll have some demos as well to show uh, you know as we uh, to show the concepts as we as we discuss them. And there's many ways to arrive at the same result. You know, my first kernel patch about 13, 14 years ago was actually not even using any kernel debugging tools. It was actually looking at Wireshark traces uh, and there was a bug in the bridging code of the Linux kernel. Uh, and that was my first patch that came out just from looking at the traces uh, in Wireshark, which is this network analyze, an analysis tool. And then, you know, forming some theories about the issue and trying different things and, and they should just went, went away. So. You know, like I said, there's many ways to arrive at the same result and many different tools uh, that you can use uh, depending on what you're doing. But we'll uh, we'll be discussing the most common, some of the most common and easy to use tools that that you should know, like those dots that you should know so that you can connect them at some point in, in the in the future. Okay, so, and uh, you know, it's important to have an attitude to try new things. Like when you hit a real problem, experiment, you know, Try different things, and, and that attitude is very important. Always keep keep trying, and it's always impossible until it's done, like Nelson Mandela said. Uh, so always, you know, keep trying new things, and and uh, nothing nothing is too hard, uh, you know, until until you do it. So let's ju jump into GDB. Uh, so so why use GDB, right? I'm talking I'm talking about using GDB on on a live running system. Uh, one reason to use it would be to you know understand the code flow. So by you know uh, by using GDB, you can uh, walk through like a piece of code line by line, uh, you know, in the debugger and understand like how it's flowing and uh, how the control is is going through it, what the variables are, and so forth. You can also dump data structures uh, using GDB and understand what the structures look like, what the assembler looks like, and so forth. Yeah, it's and GDB is very good at debugging hangs because when the system hangs, you can connect to it and you can look at the state of the system at that moment in time, which is very very useful. And some reasons not to use it, in my opinion, are uh, if the issue is not easy to reproduce, right? Then uh, a debugger cannot help you at that 
you know, on a live running system because you can't even reproduce the issue in the first place. So well, what's the debug going to do, right? Um, if you don't know what to look for, and, and also sometimes you cannot run GDB at all on a on a uh, on a system because it's in production or something like that. So those are some reasons why GDB is not necessarily that helpful. Um, but GDB can also be helpful offline. So if you you know if you want to uh, analyze a core dump uh, using GDB, you can uh, you can pass the core dump to GDB and look at the state of the system and all all that kind of stuff using GDB. Uh, so it does have some use uh, if you have a core dump, uh, but otherwise I find it not that useful if, if you cannot reproduce the issue and, and so forth. So let's see. Um, so I will only talk about QMU and, and demo QMU and GDB, um, but the same principles apply to different ways of using GDB as well. Like for example, KGDB is a way to connect to a uh, a real Linux system that's not emulated and uh, and connect GDB to, to that system. Um, and there's other uh, tools that like OpenOCD and stuff that work with GDB. OpenOCD is more for embedded type of devices, but like QMU is very nice to practice. So you can, you're gonna test different things with QMU and uh, you know, like kind of sharpen the blade with like, uh, your your uh, your abilities of, of of debugging and so forth, and then apply those same concepts to to these other technologies that are useful in in, in these other environments. Um, you can also run GDB uh, server on a, a remote host and actually run GDB locally, and then connect to that remote host uh, as well. That's useful for debugging like a user space application running on on a remote host. Uh, so those are some of the other uses, but we are only going to talk about QMU. So to start uh, the G, uh, to to start QMU in QMU's GDB server, which the GDB client connects, so you pass these options minus S and minus capital S. Uh, minus S starts the server, and minus capital S actually waits for GDB to connect to the um, you know, waits for the GDB client to connect to the GDB server, and only then starts the vir virtual machine. So the virtual machine will wait until you actually connect to it, uh, connect to it from a GDB client and, and hit continue. Um, and minus S starts the GDB server, like I said, so that uh, starts G the GDB server at, at the port of one, two, three, four. Uh, and uh, you know you start the GDB client uh, by running, just running GDB VM Linux uh, and then running target remote uh, localhost one, two, three, four, which connects, uh, you know, because QMU is running on the same machine that uh, we're, uh, we're connecting GDB to, you, you, you connect it to the same, to, to localhost one, two, three, four, and then it'll show some output like this, and then you hit continue. So I can show this as a demo as well, really quick. Let's see. So let's see. So I have a script that already uh, passes minus S. So here I'm starting QMU and passing these options and it's actually waiting for GDB to connect. So I connect with GDB like that. So you can pass that target remote on the GDB command line itself when you start GDB instead of entering it later. So that's using the minus EX option. And that's very useful because you don't have to enter it later. Okay, and so right now we're connected to the VM and I just hit continue and you can see the VM is going to start off like that. Okay, so that's that's what I wanted to show you so far. Let me go back here. Okay. Okay, so couple of things that I want to mention. Um, without uh, without config debug info, you won't get uh, any line information. So you have to enable config debug info, which will add that line information, uh, the symbol to line information mapping to your VM Linux kernel binary, which we passed to GDB. Um, so I already have that enabled. So I'm already going to see line information for my different symbols. 
uh, but uh, if you didn't, you would not see anything. Okay, uh, you would not see any line information, you, but you would still may you may or may not see symbols, and I'll go over why you may not see symbols. Uh, so there's this feature in in uh, Linux called KS ASLR, which loads the kernel at a random uh, address uh, when it when the when the system boots, and the reason for that is security. So by loading it at a different address, you make uh, things like buffer overflow attacks uh, much more difficult. Um, and so this is actually a big problem of debuggers because KSLR, because, because GDB uh, would not be able to know where the kernel is loaded. So if you don't, if you have KSLR enabled, you'll see something like this, uh, where it'll just, you know, if you do a backtrace, it'll just show you uh, like these numbers, it won't show you the symbols. So you have to pass uh, no KSLR boot, boot parameter, which I'm already passing to my uh, QMU, uh, set up already. So that's why we saw those symbols. Uh, you know, we were able to see this symbol name along with a number. Um, so, so if you pass no KSLR, you'll start seeing the, the symbol names, okay? So no KSLR and debug info, those are the two things that you have to pass. So now let me talk about, now that we're connected to the VM, what can we do, right? So. Uh, so one, one thing is, if you run info threads in GDB, it'll show you the stacked frame, which is basically the function we're in on all the all the the CPUs. Okay, so info threads will show you that, and the star points to which CPU we're currently going to be uh, like running commands on, like showing the backtrace and and so forth. Uh, and then if you want to switch CPUs, you just use the thread command and say it like, if I want to switch to the second CPU, I say thread two. So now GDB is uh, focusing on the second CPU and I can I can do a backtrace and, and get the second CPU's backtrace. And now if I want to switch to the third one, I do thread three and I can, you know, I can do backtrace and get the third CPUs. So you can you can keep switching between these different CPUs and analyze analyze the stacks. Uh, at at this point in time. Uh, so now let's uh, try to uh, set a breakpoint. So while we're in the same session, I'm gonna continue. Make sure the VM is still doing okay, and then I'm gonna set a breakpoint on on the panic function. Okay, so I set breakpoint on panic like that, and now I continue. Okay, so the panic function is called whenever the kernel panics. So whenever it cannot proceed with its execution, you have the panic happen. So let me crash the kernel and show you. And there we go. We hit the panic function. So the you know the VM stopped right there. And if I do a backtrace, I can see that it's showing me uh, the 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 whole chain of events that happened leading to panic, which is the sysrq write that we just we just did. Okay, so that's uh, setting a breakpoint. And if I do, well, is it showing me? Yeah, so it also shows you the, the arguments to panic as well. As you can see, it shows you the arguments there. Um, and you can also see the code. So if you, if you type list, it will show you the, the, the actual C code for panic, which is super useful. Like right when the breakpoint is hit, if you just type list, it'll show you the C code. And again, this is only possible because of config debug info, because GDB knows where which, uh, what the panic symbol corresponds to, which lines of code does correspond to. Okay. You can also do disassemblies at this point. So if you type this this S or D this assemble, it will show you all the assembler instructions at panic. So this is really useful if you want to uh, look at what the assembler looks like and step through the assembler uh, instruction and instruction and so forth. Um, so if you don't want to see C code and if you just want to see the assembler, you just type this uh, disassemble. Um, and another thing you could do is add, uh, you know, and GDB, you can type info registers and it'll show you all this, all the registers, uh, 
you know that that are the, and their values at at the point that the breakpoint is hit. So you can see here our RIP register is actually showing panic because that's where we're at. And it also shows all the special registers, like for example, CR3 is uh, used for the page tables and 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 so forth. Um, and these XM registers are related to floating point registers. So it shows you a lot of state. It shows you the flags as well, the the E flags register. So info registers will will show you that. Okay. And you can look at the arguments that were passed to the panic function. So if you say info args, it will show you the uh, the arguments that was passed to panic. So FMT is the argument that was passed to panic. And you can also look at the local variables. So if you say info locals, uh, it'll show you the local local variables in the panic function. Okay. So if we do a list, we can actually see. Uh, you can see some local variables here, args, i, state, and so forth. Then you do info local, you can see those local variables. The reason it says optimized out is because GDB has not yet reached the instructions that uh, populate the, the registers that hold those values. So it doesn't know what those uh, local variables are yet. But as we step through it, uh, you know, they will start showing up as well. Um, let's see. Okay, and so now I'll just show you GDB's TUI mode. And I'll start the VM again. Oops. Start TUI mode. Okay, so I'm connected to the VM, and TUI mode actually shows you the uh, the it has this nice display of two win two windows. On the top window is is the source code where we're at, and in the bottom is the same prompt GDB prompt we were seeing all this while. And I will I'll do the same thing. Set the breakpoint at panic, continue, and now I'm going to try to crash the kernel. Okay, so I hit the breakpoint, and you can see in the top window it's already at showing the source code. So this this is nice to it's nice to see uh, the source code uh, automatically, and instead of having to type list, right? So this is this is very nice. And if I say next, it will step it'll step to the next line in the in the window on the top. And uh, if you just hit enter and GDB, it'll go to the next, it'll re-issue uh, the previous command, which was next. So it's, if I just keep hitting enter, it'll keep doing next, next, next. Okay. And so say I want to step into this function, preempt, disable, no traces called from the panic function. If I just say step, it will step into the preempt, uh, disable function. So this is where we're at. And if I do backtrace now, it'll show you the it'll show you that we are in the preempt count add function. Uh, so backtrace also confirms that. And if you want to go back to the panic, back to the panic functions stack frame, we just say finish. And I believe we're yeah, we're back. We're back. Uh, we came out of preempt disable notice back to panic. And now if I say next, we can Keep continuing like that. And notice when I execute the PR emerge kernel panic, then it'll show you the PR kernel panic message on the left. And there you go, it showed that message. So you can see you can execute things step by step uh, and you know see the results as you as you do that, which is very useful. Um, so I should uh, so I think that concludes our GDB demo. Um, I wanted to talk about a real uh, recent use of GDB that I used. There was this issue where in, in RCU where the whole system would hang after two hours and it was very reproducible. Um, and the whole system would hang and it was completely unresponsive 
all the CPUs were unresponsive. So there's nothing in the uh, in the in the kernel logs uh, in the in the kernel console, uh, and so there's no way to actually without anything on the kernel console. You're only left with your imagination about what exactly happened. Like there's no, nothing you can do. So GDB in this situation uh, helped me like a lot. I actually we actually thought I actually thought it was a QMU bug. Um, because it was so strange that all the CPUs would lock up like that. Um, but it turned out it was a, actually a, a kernel bug. And uh, there's this code in the kernel called stop machine, which uh, makes all the CPUs stop for uh, some amount of time and interrupts are disabled and they just, they're just hung there. And we were not coming out of that stop machine state um, because one of the CPUs was misbehaving. and even the kernel watchdog wouldn't crash the system, which is the watchdog basically tries to make sure that the system is responsive. And if it's not, and I'll show you how that works as well, but uh, I'll show a demo of that as well. But even that was not like, I enabled these watchdogs and they're not crashing the system as well. So that's where GDB was like super useful because I was able to connect to the system while it was in this hung state and I was able to dump the stack. So the same way I showed you, I was able to do like info threads, and then switch to the CPU, switch to all the CPUs and, and look at the backtrace and see what exactly is going on on each CPU. And, uh, you know, uh, I found that it was this stack that was, it was always this stack on a, on a certain CPU that was constantly showing up in the backtrace. And so that led me to believe that this is something related to the timer interrupts that are uh, constantly uh, running on the CPU and are not giving up. And so then I could focus my effort on timers and I applied other tools uh, to figure out what exactly is wrong with timers. And uh, and then we ended up fixing the bug as well. So GDB is really useful in, in, in the real world. So that concludes GDB. Uh, we're, I think we're 30% through the presentation. Shua, do you wanna, um, open it up a little bit for questions or? We don't have any questions at the moment. Okay. Um, there were questions about uh, KGDB uh, versus GDB. I think all of those have been answered. So okay. I think, yeah, go ahead. Um, okay. And then also one question, well, I, I guess I, on second thought, I have a question of my own. Um, in, in this particular case, um, in some cases, G, uh, GDB, you cannot reproduce the problem, obviously, right? Because definitely, if you are any timing related issue and such, it, yeah. GDB could be in the way of being able to raise conditions and such. So, could you, will you be able to elaborate a little bit on um, situations where uh, GDB is uh, very useful? You're, you're talking about this particular case, understanding the code flow. Um, but a type of bugs, will you be able to elaborate yeah. on that as you go along? Yeah, yeah, that's certainly, that's a, that's a good point that because we're stopping the whole system, um, we may not be able to, like, we're kind of changing the timing, right, of the system. So we may not be able to reproduce certain bugs related to race conditions, uh, that, uh, you know, depend on, on, on timing and stuff. So yeah, GDB is, cannot, is not really useful for such situations and tracing is more useful. Uh, and there's other tools other than GDB like uh, KSAN, for example, that can uh, detect, uh, sorry, KCSAN that can detect concurrency bugs with, uh, with races. And then there's lock depth uh, that can detect like issues with locking and so forth. So yeah, G GDB is not useful for that. Like it's, for, for those kind of situations, yeah. So it looks like we have a couple of questions in the Q&A. Uh, can you see the Q&A or would you like um, me to read it out? I can try to see it, uh, but- uh, That's I'm, all right, I can, yeah. I can read right. it and let's see. Um, this is from, uh, the first question is from Dimitrios. How would you debug a reproducible complete freeze of the kernel in a QMU VM, which causes the kernel to ignore even the GDB interrupts? Um, yeah, I mean, in, in such a situation, uh, you probably, what you want to do is try to get a core dump of the, 
of the of the memory of the system, and then you can run GDB on that off you know offline. Um, obviously, you can you can I mean if you can't connect using GDB, then you can't use it. So GDB is out of question there. Um, so yeah, uh, and the other thing is like so, uh, sometimes sometimes GDB doesn't work well if you use software breakpoints. Like the kernel doesn't really work. That doesn't play well with software breakpoints. Although the demo I just showed you was using a software breakpoint. So use hardware breakpoints. Instead of break, you would use edge break, and uh, that would give you give you better results. Okay. Great, thank you. The second question is, can GD be uh, used on a live machine and not VM, specifically when accessing PMU yep. registers directly using read MSR safe on CPU? Um, I, yes, I believe you can you can do that. Uh, you can you, you can uh, do those things with KGDB. Yeah, so you would run KGDB on uh, on the you know on the on the machine and then run GDB on another machine and then connect to it and um, uh, do those operations. I believe you can dump MSRs as well. Um, so you can do a lot with GDB. Okay. okay. All right, there is one more question. Can we use GDB to debug third party kernel module problems? Yes, you can. You can certainly do that. And there's these scripts uh, in GDB uh, one of the things you can do with GDB is you can actually dump the, the kernel logs, for example. So you can see this is me dumping the kernel logs while I'm in GDB itself. And then you can browse through the kernel logs. Um, so there are these GDB scripts that are very useful. Uh, I haven't used them recently, but they're, they're out there uh, and they're very useful for uh, debugging uh, kernel modules. So. Uh, one of the challenges with kernel modules is figuring out how the symbols in the kernel module map to addresses and vice versa. And uh, that requires you to know like the layout of how the module is loaded into memory and so forth. And um, that that's very difficult to do manually. So these GDB scripts in the kernel um, help you uh, help you do help you do that. Uh, and they can do a lot of things as well. Like, you know, you can, other than the kernel logs dump, sometimes the console will not show you the kernel logs. And, uh, you know, because the console driver has a problem or something like that. And, but if you can get, uh, if you can connect GDB, then you can just extract the kernel logs from the system's memory using L using LXD message. Um, so definitely check out the uh, GDB scripts and to, uh, to, uh, Build them. You have to say make scripts GDB, and that will result in this the the GDB script string created. And then you just run GDB in the same directory as kernel, and then you can just use the scripts. So they're they're very useful. Okay. Uh, one more question. Do you have yeah. examples in your demo later on using JTAG? I don't have demo using JTAG, um, but the like the concepts are the same. Like if you use this open source tool called open OCD uh, it can um, uh, it can uh, expose a GDB server which then you can use GDB to connect to open OCD which will connect to JTAG so uh, you know the same concepts apply uh, but I know I don't have demo for this presentation for that so it looks like we have one more question when it comes to certain registers gdb seems to have lim some limitations is there a way to force gdb to read the value of registers such as msrs and others that it doesn't display by default i th i don't know off the top of my head because i haven't done that but i would be very surprised if there is no way to do that uh, i think there should be their gdb commands to um, to uh, to do the do those kinds of operations, um, but uh, yeah, I don't know off the top of my head. Yeah, I think there is just one last question before um, I think uh, before yeah. you can. Uh, is this preferred setup QMU plus G Q GDB to start with working on kernel bugs for newbies who are um, exploring in in de exploring the kernel? Um, 
Yes, I think so. Uh, like a lot of kernel bugs actually can be reproduced using just QMU um, because they don't really depend on some hardware, but they're like, you know, more to do with memory and page tables and those kind of stuff. Um, so yeah, I mean, you can certainly look at some issues and, and debug them using GDB uh, for sure. Uh, you know, just using QMU and GDB. Uh, in fact, QMU is really, really useful, really, really important for kernel development because a lot of testing happens with QMU. Um, like, you know, these, uh, the nice thing about QMU is you can spin like hundreds of instances of QMU and test like different kernels in parallel on the same machine, right? You don't need real hardware to, to you know, to do that. And so QMU is very, actually a very useful a, a tool for kernel development and for reproducing bugs and stuff like that. There's other projects like the Syscaller project, which are heavily uses QMU for for fuzzing the kernel. Um, so uh, yeah, it's it's really useful. And Shua definitely will agree with me on that. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Um, yeah, okay. Um, it uh, the kernel CI runs them, and yep. then the build runs them so absolutely okay qmu definitely has a lot of advantages to get quickly get started and then you will be able to experiment with different kernels um different things however as uh, joel mentioned uh, definitely if you anything architecture related or anything dt device tree related and then anything acpi or firmware related definitely uh, cpu and drm stuff you can't really exercise that uh, with the QMU. So you have they 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 both have places, and some things you yeah. can do with a very cheap laptop. You won't be able to do with QMU. So it's it just depends on what the bug yeah. is and how you, what your use case is. So uh, there is one question though, Joel, but I will let you decide whether you want to um, answer it yeah. now or push it out for later. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, we can quickly. Look at that. Let me check how we're doing on time. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, please. I think yeah, thirty-four minutes. So I, yeah, I think we can take one question and then uh, I, I'll see how if if it's something that's already answered later, then we can just discuss it later. Otherwise, I can take it now as well. Um, I think you might have answered this question. Can we keep the kernel running under GDB server environment in cases where kernel freezes after some time? Yeah, you can do that. You can certainly do that. And that's exactly how I debug that two hour issue I was referring to with RCU. Uh, so you just, you know, run the GDB server, keep it uh, keep it active. And then once it hangs, you know, you just connect to the, the instance at that, that point in time. Okay. And there is one question, but I don't think this is, does adding disk C and C cache to speed up kernel builds and tests complicate debugging? That has nothing to do with uh, C yeah. cache speeds of build. It has nothing to do with actual running the kernel and uh, debugging, being able to. Yeah. Optimization might though, depending on your kernel compiler options that you want to check and see. Yeah, um, but C cache should be aware of that. And and if you okay. change the optimization, I guess C cache should just uh, do a cache miss, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I guess it has to, the, the object it provides should be identical to what was generated when Ccache could not provide the object, I guess. Right. But yeah, uh, definitely compiler optimizations are important. Uh, there's this option I forgot to mention uh, that I had on one of the slides for, oh, actually I'm talking about it later. This is on, on generating backtrace, uh, like good quality backtracers. Um, and it's, uh, yeah, actually it's this slide. So there's this option called config frame pointers. And if you don't enable this option, then the stacks that you get um, in the kernel when a kernel crash happens, they will have some, sometimes they might have certain symbols missing in it. So this config frame point is if possible, it's it's a good thing to enable so that the, the unwinder inside the kernel does a better job of unwinding the stack. Otherwise, um, the kernel try, tries to, it has this uh, thing called or, orc, which is a concise debug information that is stored, that is embedded in the kernel. And at runtime, it refers to this orc to do the unwinding, um, which is also how the same debug information is how uh, GDB does unwinding. So if you want good runtime unwinding, definitely enable frame pointers. 
Okay, so symbols are not missing in your back traces. So sure, shall we continue? Uh, yeah, yes, please. Okay. okay, so the next thing I wanna, the next dot that I wanna talk about is uh, trace, uh, trace command function graph. So this is a very nice uh, tool that'll show you, like give you an overview of what is exactly going on. If you want to look at, okay, what's going on in this function, right? Um, uh, so uh, I can show you a quick demo of that. So in this case, I want to see like up to three levels deep inside of K-free, I want to see what functions are being called. K-free and, and, and three levels inside of it. Um, and so I can run uh, this uh, command. Let me actually start my VM again and it's booting. Let it finish pooling. Okay, so actually, let me pass max graph depth of five. So if I do this, and it's now tracing uh, the, the function graph tracer of the kernel is running, and it's it's tracing K three. And now I stop. Uh, I can actually see. And I do trace CMD report. I should be able to see, uh, you know, I should I should get these long traces of uh, K free of K free and what K free was calling. So, uh, you know, you can see K free call these functions. So this is very useful. I've been using this for many many years to uh, understand how different kernel functions work, what they're doing to kind of understand the code flow. So you can just run a tool, run trace command record minus p function graph, uh, minus minus graph max graph depth or whatever. Uh, and it will show you, you know, the flow. So this, I would highly recommend anybody uh, trying to understand the kernel source code flow or any part of the kernel where you have a suspicion like me to understand it better or how it's doing or what it's doing. I would definitely recommend uh, running running this. Okay, so in this case, I did a system wide uh, system wide tracing. So in the whole system, it's looking at what exactly is K free doing. Okay, just to go over the options, minus G stands for graph function. So from which function onwards we start tracing, and uh, then it will just keep tracing all the functions that are inside of that graph function. So that's minus G. Okay, and so the next thing uh, is, another useful use of function graph tracer is actually to find function execution times, okay? Like if you, if you suspect that, I think this function is really slow, okay? But I, 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 I wanna measure its performance, right? One way is you could insert timestamps at the beginning and the end, but the function graph tracer will already do it for you, so you don't need to waste your time. So for example, if I want to find out, um, oops, I want to find out all instances of VFS read and how much time they took, I can just pass minus L VFS read. Minus L basically filters to, to only that function. It will only trace that function and, and nothing else. N not the functions that call it and not the function it calls. It only traces VFS read and tries to build a graph out of that. So obviously, because it's only tracing VFS read, it will only print VFS read and hush and you know show how much time that function took. So I can show you a quick demo of that. So again, I'm here. I'm running trace command record minus p function graph minus l VFS read, and I stop there. And now when I do a report. Uh, it will show me, uh, you know, I only had two instances of VFS read called in the entire trace. So it shows me uh, well, here, the first one and the second one. And it shows you this nice plus uh, sign for if the function took a long time to run. I believe it shows you an exclamation if it took even longer, like hundreds or thousands of microseconds. So definitely use the function graph tracer more as you, as you, uh, ex you know, explore the source code and you do your debugging, definitely definitely use this. And there's a there's lots of options where if you want to trace only kernel functions that are called for a certain execution, you can pass like a certain uh, different options. I believe that's the minus F option where you can pass it like, uh, you know, a command or or something like that. And it'll only trace, uh, it'll only trace uh, that function. 
uh, that that execution. It won't trace the whole system. So those are the two things I wanted to talk about um, for trace command. Now I would jump into, and we'll take questions about trace command later as well. But now I'll jump into a real, uh, uh, a demo, uh, a demo of a kernel bug that I introduced uh, just to show you another tool, which is useful for finding uh, like long scheduler latencies. Um, so what I did is I instrumented the kernel and I added a, uh, I intentionally added a loop in the context switch path to slow down the context switch path just to uh, introduce this bug. So uh, I can show you, I'll show you the code and then I'll show you the, uh, the demo as well. So the code is here. Okay, so this function RCU note context switch is uh, called from the context switch path. Okay, and all I do there is if we have the boot argument enable CS bug enable. I just spin for uh, a certain amount of time every thousand occurrences. So I don't spin every time, but if I ever hit uh, if I ever hit this uh, every thousand times, then I will do the spin. Okay, um, and I don't do this for the first five seconds of of the boot because I had some issues with getting the timestamps early during boot because the clock source is not up and all that. So I just wait for five seconds, five uh, five seconds, and then I I do this spin. Um, so it's like every thousand times I will hit uh, I will hit this every thousand context switches I'll hit this. Okay, so it's not a something that happens all the time. So it doesn't cripple my system, but it's also not ideal. So I uh, I'll show you the the demo. So now I just boot my kernel. Oops. Okay, so I'm passing this boot parameter so that the, the bug starts showing up. And I boot. Okay, so now it will do some prints as well. Every thousand occurrences, it actually does a print that the you know we are we are through thousand uh, every thousand context switches it'll print four thousand five thousand six thousand like that and now if I run uh, some command like first get record uh, so uh, okay so what am I doing here right so here what I'm doing is I'm I'm running the find command uh, and I'm running perf to record perf traces perf is another tool that is used for uh, recording like traces, uh, but, and, and it has other other features as well, like profiling and stuff, but perf sked is particularly useful for recording scheduling traces. Um, so I, I can say perf sked record, uh, and I wanna kill the find function as well, once, it, uh, once 10 seconds have passed. Okay, and I do that and now I'm recording traces. The find is going to do its thing. And the find command is running and it's definitely hitting this bug because find is doing a lot of things and it's definitely context switching and hitting this bug. So now perf is done running and perf writes the perf traces. And now I can run, now that the perf traces are collected, it, it shows up in perf.data in this file. If you do perf, uh, perf script, it will actually show you all the traces with the timestamp, okay? Um, and that's great, right? This is like all the information that you could ever need. But what's really cool is you can do perf sked latency, run perf sked latency, which will actually look at that perf uh, .date data file, all the traces in it, and it will show you the worst case latency that the system experienced. So if you do uh, sort, uh, if you do sort max like that, it'll show you the stable. And uh, you can see here that different commands experience different, uh, different uh, processes experience uh, different uh, latencies. So 
Um, the worst was actually the RC preem thread, which experienced a max delay of 300 microseconds and uh, you know an average delay of 150 microseconds. And what's really cool is per scared latency will also show you not only the worst uh, the the processes that experienced the worst latency, it will also show you where the latency started in the trace and where it stopped. So if you take this timestamp, okay, 78.06 seconds, and you do per script, and then you uh, search for that timestamp, it'll it'll take you right to that. So somewhere around here, the uh, the latency started. So you can see that the RST preempt thread was preempted out by the by a migration thread, and so that's that's the point from which it started to wait. So Perfscale will not only show you the amount of time pro processes are, or tasks, as we say in Linux, are waiting for CPU uh, after they wake up, but also when they were preempted. So in this case, the state R here tells us that our CPU preempt was running and it was forced off of the CPU uh, so that another thread could run of higher priority, okay? Uh, and uh, you know it will also show perf scared will also show perf scared latency sort will also show you where the the latency stopped. So these two fields were actually added by me because I really wanted to see where the latency stops starts and stops um, in this giant trace, right? Um, I want to narrow it down, so I actually added that to the perf uh, perf tool myself. Uh, I I've used this tool like a lot in the last like three or four years to fight various scheduling latency type of issues. Um, I literally upstreamed like a major scheduling feature which took us 10 months to, to uh, upstream. Uh, I found like tons of uh, bugs in the scheduler using this, uh, this just these two commands uh, because I can run a use case I, and then run these two commands and I, I can Im instantly see, boom, like, you know, that's where the problem started, that's where it ended. So I could iterate very quickly on, on finding and fixing a lot of bugs, a lot of scheduling related bugs. Another thing I do is I actually run perf sched and trace commands sometimes at the same time. You can actually run them at the same time. And where that is useful is trace command is really good at event tracing. Uh, and perf is really good at summarizing a large trace. Uh, trace command is not good at that. And, and uh, Stephen Rosted is actually working on tools to improve that. Um, but this is, uh, this is what I do just to show you my, uh, my secrets, so to speak. I'm giving away all my secrets in this presentation because I want everybody to do really well. And I want the kernel community to really prosper and Linux to be great. So. I'm giving you this this away. This is what I do, and I would encourage you to, if you have scheduler problems, check this out and and run these tools and and you know uh, make make the scheduler better. Um, another thing you can do is you can pass like options to perf sched, um, uh, uh, where you uh, so perf sched by default it'll only record scheduler event, but say you want to record another event like C. Like I want to also record CPU idle trace events, uh, and I want them to be in the perf trace as well. I can actually pass minus e, and then the the actual trace event that I want want to in, you know, and it'll be interspersed with the uh, uh, with the uh, scheduling traces. So so what I can do is I can quickly run this and show you. So here, uh, so let me run it. Let me run find again. Now perf is running and it's collecting all the traces. How are we doing on time? Got right. 40 so, minutes, uh, about okay. around, yeah, around 40 minutes. Okay, awesome. So uh, now when I do perf script, I not only see the scheduler events, I also see the uh, CPU idle events. So if the scheduler traces were not enough, like you see that the latency started here and ended there, but you want to know deep, you want to go deeper and see, okay, what, were there any power management events, were the CPU idle events and so forth. You can pass minus E and enable all of those and then look at 
okay, you know, it'll, it, it might tell you that, okay, this event actually caused the, caused the latency to happen, right? Um, and so that's why enabling events like that can be really, really useful. Okay, so that's uh, trace command and perf. Uh, now let me jump into another thing that I do quite a lot. And um, this is not too difficult, but it's something that, you know, to keep in mind is that uh, there's this technique called shotgun debugging, which actually Stephen Rosted taught me, like he does this a lot. And uh, you basically, when you sprint, when you take a piece of code and you put print case in it, you sometimes uh, don't need, like sometimes you might like print a certain message and print a another message. Instead, what you can do is you can just copy paste this line and just put it all over the place. And uh, let me show you a quick demo of that as well. So here, um, let's see here. So I have this uh, shotgun.diff that I will, apply to the kernel sources. Yeah, I applied it. And here what I've done is I've I've printed this trace print k uh, line, which shows the file name the, and the line number. Uh, uh, it's the exact same line. I've copy pasted that like six times. Because well, what I was trying to do here is show how you could, uh, just like GDB, right? You could do this and you could look at the, the flow of execution. You can actually see, okay, were, were these branches taken or were these not taken? Like, what exactly is this function doing, right? So, if you do print k or trace print k, trace print k actually prints the message to the kernel uh, trace buffer. Um, you could, uh, uh, you know, it's the same thing. You could you could quickly identify how how certain function is flowing. So, if so, here I sprinkle trace print k around. I believe it's around the same path. Uh, where that bug was that yeah where that context switch bug was that's exactly where I'm uh, also uh, doing this trace print care of file and line numbers and um, let me uh, copy the kernel binaries for the demo and let me boot boot the kernel and so now in this kernel it's actually Ex uh, executing those trace print case, and it'll show you like an output that looks like this. And so it'll show you like, okay, this function was in this file and this line number. And you can put this across different files and it'll show you the files and the line numbers. And then you can go back to your development editor and you can see, okay, it went here and here and here and here. So that's what this function is doing. So this is another really useful uh, thing that I do on a regular basis to to debug the kernel and get a better sense of what is going on. Uh, that's simple. And another thing you could do to understand what the kernel is up to is you could dump the 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 stack uh, at any given point in time into the trace buffer. So for this demo, I have uh, let me check out the code. So let me take away the code of the other demo and let me show you uh, what I'm gonna demo now. So here in the scheduler, uh, schedule, scheduling loop, this is what executes every time a process goes to sleep or it, sw or it, it switches to another uh, process or, or, or task. Um, and here what I'm doing is, uh, let's see. Yeah, so what I'm doing is, so this this came out of a real problem that I was facing. I was seeing that RCU torture, which is RCU testing uh, uh, suite, the testing kernel module, was actually entering uh, uninterruptible sleep quite a lot, right? And I could only see that it was entering uninterruptible sleep, but I didn't know why it was entering or which path it was taking to enter that sleep because it enters uh, uninterruptible sleep in a lot of places. So I didn't know which place to look at. I just knew it was entering uninterruptible sleep. So what I did is I went to the schedule loop and I I put a, a, some code there that the, basically says every 10 occurrences of this, of, of an uninterruptible sleep, uh, dump, the, dump the stack, dump the stack to the trace buffer. Um, so what this does is like, I first of all, I wasn't flooding the trace buffer because a lot of things might be doing uninterruptible sleep. 
So I, will, I, want to, so I, I thought I'll do a sampling kind of approach where I'll only do it every 10 instances. I won't like do it all the time. And uh, let me demo this uh, as well. Okay, his kernel is copied. Start preemu. And I'm not sure fully if uh, I will see traces, but I should be able to see something that is entering an interval sweep if I run some commands. Okay. And now let me read the kernel trace buffer. Okay, yeah. So I ignore the prints from the previous demo. So this is the important stuff. So you can see that there's some K worker here that actually entered the schedule loop and, and uh, you know, we dumped the stack. So this, uh, this uh, this worker thread was uh, actually the one that called schedule. Uh, not sure why, but uh, that's what it did. So um, yeah, so this is another useful trick. Um, just looking at the stack, where you know you know that okay, the the system is behaving in a certain way, right? In this case, it's, it was actually entering uninterruptible sleep. So now I now I want to know why it is doing that, who is doing that, right? So now you can go back to the kernel and say, okay, every time this happens, I'm going to dump the whole stack to the trace buffer. And I've debugged a lot of issues like this. Another one was uh, with this SE Linux violation where you know I was seeing these SE Linux messages and I was like, oh, you know who who's uh, who's doing these things? And if you're just dumping the stack, you can see the whole like code flow and 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 uh, and uh, you know why you ended up there. Uh, so now next, I want to show you uh, kernel hand. So here I have a, a kernel module that I wrote that basically uh, hangs the the system. And the way it hangs is that I storm a I storm a certain CPU with a lot of uh, IPIs, which are interprocessor interrupts, uh, to a point where that CPU just can't do anything but service those IPIs. So that that causes a lot of problems. So let me uh, show you the code for that really quick. So here I, I start my module as uh, the init function of the module, I create a kernel thread on the CPU on which the init function of the module is running. And I select the target CPU as the next CPU modulo the number of CPU IDs. And uh, the kernel thread, what it does is it that target CPU, it floods it with IPIs using this function called SMP call function single async. Okay, and it uh, so what it does is for 50 seconds, it floods uh, 1,000 1, IPIs every five milliseconds. So after 1,000 IPIs, it will go to sleep for five milliseconds. And then again, it'll do the thousand, and again, it'll do the thousand. So this is enough to hang the kernel because that CPU, uh, hang at least hang that CPU. And sometimes the kernel doesn't hang immediately, but eventually you start seeing issues, and I'll show you those issues. But uh, but that's what this module does. Okay, and just to demo that, let me see. Let me go step by step here. So actually, what I want to do is show you GDB. Uh, show you GDB. Uh, actually, showing you this. IPI flood. So I'm going to start QMU with uh, with the uh, GDB option, and I'm going to connect. Uh, make sure I copy the right kernel. Okay, and I'm going to connect GDB. Okay, and we're booting. And now I'm going to load my uh, kernel module that will storm IPIs, as I mentioned. I think I'm not able to load my module because for some reason. Let me try something else.
Okay, so my kernel module loaded and it's uh, CPU three is flooding CPU zero with uh, with IPIs. Okay, so now I stop GDB here and if I do in four threads, you can see that that's exactly what is happening. CPU zero is actually in this IPI handler and it's doing this, uh, you know, this whole call stack is basically that IPI handler that's doing that M sleep, uh, M delay inside of the, inside of the IPI, okay? And, it, you know, if I continue and I stop, I'm always gonna see the same stack trace on the CPU zero because it's, you can, basically this tells you that that CPU is all, is locked up. It's never going idle, right? Like if you look at some of the other uh, CPUs, you'll see that, like if I switch to a, a CPU, uh, CPU two, it's going to show uh, that we are in the idle idle loop, right? But uh, that CPU zero is never going to go idle because my kernel module is, is giving it a hard time. Okay, so now I'm going to continue. And uh, what we will see is eventually we will see our RCU stalls uh, showing up. Uh, and I could have accelerated the RCU stalls, but RCU stalls are basically uh, this issue where RCU uh, is not able to make progress because some CPU is locked up. Um, and it takes like 20, 30 seconds uh, to happen, but there's a way to accelerate it by telling RCU to, uh, RCU to reduce its stall timeout. Um, okay, what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna And some uh, some and the thing about RCU stalls. So let me talk a little bit about RCU stalls uh, while this is this is boring. Um, I showed you the stacks showing that the C, that CPU was hung. Um, RCU stalls. Uh, so the thing about RCU stalls is that you won't see an RCU stall unless you have some RCU activity in the system. That's why RCU stalls are not a good way of detecting hangs. Um, because sometimes RCU stall will happen much later uh, if you don't have any RCU act activity, okay? So uh, what I'm gonna do is um, I'm gonna try to hang the system. Uh, let's see if an RCU stall shows up now. Yeah, there we go. So RCU detected a stall. And you can clearly see here, it's in the RC stall warning, it'll show you that CPU zero, this zero dash actually points the, that the, that CPU zero is actually not responding. And so when you see an RCU stall, that usually indicates that the, the CPU is, is not responding and it has, a, it's locked up. But there are many reasons why RCU stalls can happen um, and, and they're really bad. But this is not the best way to detect a, a lockup in the system. For that, there's another uh, tool called the hard, hard lockup detector, which I want to talk about next. Um, and basically what the hard lockup detector does is, uh, so there's different kinds of lockups, okay? Uh, there's hard lockup, there's soft lockup, and then there's something called hung tasks, which we're not going to talk, talk about right now. Uh, but a soft lockup happens when uh, you have the system is, is spinning in kernel mode, it's spending a lot of time in kernel mode, uh, but, but that's what it, all it's doing. It's, it's still able to process interrupts and so forth. Uh, whereas a hard, lock, a hard lockup means even interrupts are not able to be serviced. And the issue we're seeing with this IPI being flooded, uh, the, the system is always executing this IPI. And so the other IRQs are not able to be, be executed. And, you, st you start seeing hard lockup. So I will show you the hard lockup detector. Uh, actually, instead of RCU stalls showing you the hang, I'll show you the hard lockup detector. It's also itself showing you the hang as well. Uh, let me run the demo again. Okay, and before I load my kernel module, uh, I'm going to, before I load my kernel module, I'm gonna start the uh, hard lockup detector. Okay, so this watchdog thresh basically tells us that uh, we wanna detect lockups like within two seconds. So every two seconds, the C that CPU has to respond to these watchdog timer interrupts. If it stops, if it doesn't respond to those interrupts, then uh, we conclude 
that that CPU is locked up and we dump the stack of that CPU from another CPU uh, and so forth. But it can also happen uh, in some systems from the perf interrupt, which is an NMI and it, it dumps the, it detects this on the CPU that is locked up by uh, interrupting it with an NMI. If you don't have NMIs, another CPU can uh, can do the detection instead. So uh, all the CPUs have to respond in two seconds. And right now, actually, all the CPUs are responding. That's why the system is 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 doing okay. Okay, uh, that one is actually to en enable this uh, the 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 lockup detection. Okay, so now when I load my kernel module, it should print a, a dump. Okay. And let's see if the lockup is being detected. It should have detected it by now. So something is going on. Uh, let's see. Okay, so it, it actually did detect it. It just printed it in the D message. And because I passed the quiet option, I believe, to uh, do to, to the kernel, so I didn't print it on the console. But it did detect the uh, lockup. So you can see it says hard lockup on CPU zero, which is exactly what our target for the IPIs were. So tar CPU zero was what we flooded with IPIs and the, the hard lockup detector detected, successfully detected the, the lockup. So this is a better way to uh, you know to debug lockups than, uh, than use the RCU stall detect detection. Uh, and basically you can see that uh, it will show you that uh, you know, on that CPU zero from the backtrace, you can see that we were in that IPI handler. This is the same stack that I showed you uh, when I showed you the stack on GDB. It's the same, uh, it's the exact same stack. Okay, so that was a hard lockup detection. Um, it's uh, 2.10 Eastern time. Uh, I do have, uh, I do want to talk about F-trace. Uh, so, the next thing I want to talk about is uh, dumping the uh, dumping F trace to the console. This is another super useful thing where you can start the kernel uh, in this mode where it's collect collecting traces right from boot, and then if if it runs in if it has an oops, uh, you can dump the whole F trace buffer to the uh, console and the kernel logs. Um, so the, it's almost like a flight recorder where you know you don't know if you're going to crash or something bad is going to happen, but you just start this flight recording, and tracing is going on uh, forever. And then when a bad thing happens, like an oops or a panic, then it will dump the whole trace to the trace buffer. And there's a couple of boot parameters that uh, that you can uh, use to dump the traces on different uh, when different bad things happen. So if a kernel, so uh, so the, uh, let me talk about the options. So you have F trace dump on oops, which dumps the F trace buffer on both oops and panic to the console. Okay, and oops doesn't mean the kernel has stopped working, right? It may, this means that something bad happened. Uh, so even in those cases, it'll dump it'll dump the trace, and then it, the kernel will just uh, can, may just continue executing normally. Uh, however, when a panic happens, obviously the kernel cannot proceed uh, anymore, and everything stops. In both cases, F trace and dump on oops will dump the F trace to the the to the console and the kernel logs. Uh, and then there's an option called trace event, which uh, a boot parameter called trace event, which to which you can pass what events do you want to enable, what do you want to record in the F trace buffer, and then what buffer size do you want, right? Uh, so those are some options. And then another a few more options is F trace dump on oops will dump the trace buffer on panic, right? But Maybe you want to dump it for other reasons. Like for example, if you if you have a kernel warning, you want to dump the F trace buffer. So a nice trick you can do is just tell the kernel panic on warn. And whenever a warning goes off, it will panic. And then that panic will cause uh, a, a, a trace uh, dump to the console. That's very useful in a lot of situations where you know that warning happens, but you want to uh, you know dump the trace buffer when that the uh, warning happens. So you just panic the kernel at that point by saying panic on warn, and uh, you know the, the trace gets dumped. Essentially, the pattern is pass F trace dump on oops, and then pass panic on YYYY, where YYYY is some problem like RCU stall or warning. Uh, and 
with this combination, you can dump the trace uh, ftrace buffer to the console whenever any of these problems happen. So let me show you a quick demo where I'm passing uh, these uh, ftrace dump on loops. I'm enabling scheduler events and the CPU idle event. I'm saying I want my per CPU buffer size, ftrace buffer size to be 1K, and um, I want to panic on one, okay? So it means, it means uh, copy the right kernel, shut this down, and I'm going to run the kernel with those options. Okay, so now now tracing is going on in the background. Um, you know, to confirm that, I, if I just cat the trace buffer, I can see that it's it's it's, tra it's tracing, right? Um, so now, as soon as any warning goes off in the kernel using the warn on uh, function, it will dump the traces to the console. So I have a kernel module that uh, I wrote that just triggers a warning. Okay, so if I load that, boom. So now it's showing it. it it not only printed the warning, it's also dumping all of the traces. So this is my kernel logs uh, that are being uh, printed to the console. And you can see that it's it's showing you the, the trace buffer. So this is super useful. Like this is another thing I do all the time. Uh, like, you know, when a crash happens or when something bad happens, like a warning or something like that, I can just dump the trace buffer to the console and look at what exactly happened. And we're trying to improve that in the kernel because sometimes the console is not fast enough to uh, uh, take in all the messages coming from ftrace. Uh, so that's a work in progress, but it's it's still very useful. Um, um, I could show you a demo of the uh, IPI stall warnings, uh, the, the IPI uh, flood issue causing RCU stalls, but I think we might be out of time for that. So. Um, there's again, if you pass panic on RCU stall and you pass ftrace bump, uh, dump on oops, then uh, when that RCU stall happens, it will dump the whole trace buffer to the console. So that is super useful to, uh, to figure out why an RCU stall happened. Like, why did the CPU get locked up? Um, and I have, a, I could demo that as well if we have time, but uh, you get the idea. Uh, another very useful option is trace off on warning. Trace off on warning basically is like, so you have this flight recorder that is recording traces. The problem is that when you panic the kernel, uh, it, it will still continue tracing. The tracing doesn't stop, even though you panicked it. So trace off on warning is very useful when you want, like you know that a bad thing happened, like the warning happened. Now you don't want to trace anymore. You just want to stop disabled tracing. So this is very useful when, you you can uh, once the traces are dumped to the console, you can jump straight to the end of the trace, and you know that okay, this point, this part of the trace is where the warning uh, fired. So it takes out all the garbage after that, which might not be relevant, and uh, lets you focus only on the traces that are that are relevant. So I can quickly show you this as well. You have fifteen minutes. Uh, okay. Joel. Yeah. Is all right. Time? This should be probably our last demo, uh, just so that we can have, take some questions as well. And I'm, as you can see here, I'm passing trace off on warning, which was the only difference from last time. And tracing is going on. And now when I load the warning kernel module, it's dumping all the traces. And you can see, you'll see that in the end, after the dump completes, you'll see this disabled tracing due to warning. So the, the warning fires and then it's, and so this is a, again, very useful because I can just go to the end of this trace and look at, okay, what were the last set of events in my flight recorder before my flight crashed, so to speak, right? Um, and so that, that's another trick that I would, I would encourage you to, to look at. Uh, so just to quickly go over uh, some tools that I, did not uh, get time to cover because we have only so much time. KSAN is a tool that is very useful for uh, uh, for diagnosing um, memory uh, corruption bugs, like use after freeze and out of bounds, uh, you know, buffer overflows and stuff like that. 
uh, it has a lot of overhead. But uh, if you have, if you suspect that your system might be undergoing some kind of memory corruption or or some something like that, this is a useful option to enable to see. Okay, is, is there a kernel bug that is causing any of these C language memory safety type of issues? Okay, um, and a couple other tools I want to mention. Logdev is very useful for detecting uh, locking issues like ABBA deadlocks or. Uh, other kinds of like safety issues where you're taking a lock inside of an interrupt handler and and not inside of an interrupt handler, so you can have a deadlock and it locked up detects all that. Uh, preempt IRT off traces is very useful for finding issues in the kernel where the kernel turns off preemption or interrupts uh, and that causes when that happens the scheduler doesn't run, so that can cause a lot of latency problems. So preempt IRT off traces is very useful to. Uh, to uh, look into those uh, as well. KSAN, I will talk about. KCSAN is useful for uh, finding data races uh, in the in the kernel, where you know you uh, you uh, you uh, access uh, a shared memory location from uh, two threads or CPUs, and you you do that concurrently, and that can have bad effects uh, that are called data races, and that's uh, that's another source of bugs. KCSAN is relatively new. And it has false positives, but it's it's uh, also fixed a lot of bugs. And then hung task detector is very useful for situations where you have some task that is just hung in a uninterruptible sleep state, and um, you know the system is proceeding normally, but there's this one task that is uh, that is hung, right? And so you can run the hung task detector to uh, to uh, de diagnose those. So. Um, other than that, I wanted to talk about VS Code really quick. So the, uh, this is something I started to use a lot more this year, just because it is, uh, you know, I can run it with Clang D. So Clang D is this uh, uh, tool that uh, it's called a language server. Uh, and wh what's going on here is like, as I'm typing, the kernel is actually, uh, Clang D is actually compiling this translation unit. So I can see compiler errors, uh, as I type, which is super useful because it saves me a lot of time. You know, I mean, I don't have to, I almost never like have to go back and fix build errors now, at least like not 90% of the time ever since I started doing this. Uh, so Clang D is super useful for that. So, and VS Code is integrated with Clang D. So, uh, you know, uh, uh, this sort of thing is, is very useful. Uh, VS Code also has a couple of other things that are super useful, like, uh, git blame is built into it. And, uh, you know, so you don't need to run git blame. For example, if I go to this line, it's showing me in gray who the author is. If I hover over it, it shows me the, the, the commit and everything. So I can quickly go to different lines and see, okay, who, mo who modified this line, right? What is the commit or what's the context? I can click on the commit and it will show me more details about the, the commit and the code that changed and all that kind of stuff. Um, it, uh, VS Code also has built in git diff. Uh, which is really, really cool. Like if I type any code, it shows me this, and this left, it shows me green. So if I click on that, it shows me, okay, this is the code I modified. This is the code I added. So this is very useful to see what I changed in the code. Uh, even, and when you delete code, it will actually show you on the left in, in this different color uh, about code that was deleted. I'm not able to see that right now. Yeah, see it shows in this red arrow here. If I click on that, it will show me uh, it'll show me this red bar and it shows me that I deleted this code. So this makes development a lot of fun and a lot of like a lot easier because you you reduce your uh, your errors and so forth. Um, so uh, yeah, maybe it's a good time to take questions because VS Code crashed. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's that's pretty much all I had. Um, yeah, I'm happy to take any questions. I would, did want to show that VS Code also has this built-in terminal. If you hit Control, so this is really useful because I can be SSH into a, a machine somewhere and I can hit Control back take and it'll it'll not only edit code but also show me like a terminal on which I can do different things. So definitely use VS Code and and make your uh, make your life easier. But use whatever whatever you know makes you comfortable. So. So sure. Um, yeah. Yes, Joel. Um, so we do have a few questions. Um, okay. I feel that some questions I do have a question. Somebody is asking about if your RQ script is open source and uh, if it is, where where can we 
find it's it. not open source uh, but i could certainly do that if you don't mind reaching out to me uh, i can see if enough people are interested i can uh, put it somewhere or i can just send it to like uh, whoever uh, requests for it the reason i don't op didn't open source it because i'm doing stuff a lot of stuff in it that are specific to me and i don't want to, the burden of maintaining it uh, so that's the only reason why I kept it to myself, but I'm happy to share it. Okay, the second question. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, another question is, I have a system installed in field and I do not have console access. Then how can I check the reason for oops and how can I access oops log? How can we debug live system where traffic is running and enormous data is transacting? Okay, yeah, so that's a good question. So for that, there's a, there's some very useful tools. Uh, it's, I didn't demo it today, but it's called KXEC and KDUM, where uh, whenever like uh, a kernel panic happens, it'll reboot. You can reboot into another kernel and dump the whole kernel, uh, all the relevant parts of the kernel memory into this core dump, and then analyze it after. So that's uh, that's one way to do that. Another way to do that would be to uh, collect traces and uh, you know upload the traces periodically to some server or something like that and analyze the traces. Uh, so that th those would be some techniques uh, to uh, to help with uh, those kinds of issues. Yeah. Okay, so what's the best way to debug a specific kernel failing to boot on specific hardware? In this case, it doesn't seem the kernel comes alive. Is it possible to boot a working kernel and used KGB, KGDB plus KXEC to boot the kernel and figure out what's going on. So the question is, is the, you said the kernel, I guess I'm confused because the question said the kernel is not booting, but then it said it's booting. Uh, and uh, yeah, it, it really depends. To Usually- boot, Yeah, right, you're right. It didn't say kernel. No, kernel yeah. is not booting, it seems like. Okay. Um, usually the way to do that is to uh, start from the bootloader. Um, and uh, the problem is like uh, with KGDB, uh, it ha KGDB has to come up for you to be able to, to debug it, to, to start debugging. If, if the kernel is not booting up, up until that point where KGDB co comes up, you can't use KGDB. So for that, you need more lower level debugging tools like JTAG, um, and uh, you need to uh, probably uh, use JTAG and, and see whether, you know, the kernel is, is loading or not. Uh, you know, there's this phase of the kernel called decompression where the kernel is compressed and it has to be decompressed and then you jump into that and all that. So you have to step through that code. Uh, and for that, you need more lower level debugging tools. Um, so, so one thing it, I found, oh yeah, go ahead. Okay. Yeah, there's also like init call debugging, mm -hmm. which is very useful. Oh, if you enable init call debugging, you can see uh, what is going on in the boot process. But that is, I guess, much later than if the problem is happening before init calls are started. Then you know you need uh, you need other so you tools. Could uh, enable early init call as well. So there are some tools available uh, early on, uh, okay. but yeah, depending on the stage you get to. Um, yeah. so I, I did a blog on that. I'll, I'll post that okay. in a little bit. Um, I was playing with init call debugs, but yes, oh. but yeah, if the kernel, like Joel is saying, if the kernel doesn't boot, KGDB uh, needs to come up different stages. Yeah. Right. Ah, okay. Um, another question. What root FS are you using with QMU? Do you have a built custom root FS? So that's uh, so. What I do is I build my own CPIO archive using BusyBox. So it's a BusyBox CPIO archive, and I use that as my uh, initial RAM file system in it in it RAMFS. And then what I do is I ch root into another into 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 a Debian distribution. So I do something like that. It's a funny setup. So. Um, Again, this was not meant for public. It was meant only for me. But there's many different ways to uh, run QMU. Shua might have other ideas as well. But I think uh, people use libvirt quite a lot and virsh, uh, which uh, I didn't want to do that because I want to pass all the options bare bones to QMU. I want like full control over it. So that's why I didn't do that. 
Um, but you could build a root FS in many different ways and boot, uh, uh, boot them with QMU. Right. And then, uh, especially if uh, if you are debugging any of the problems that are on Sysbot and uh, and mm -hmm. those sites, they provide you disk image and an image yeah. and all the artifacts, so you can just bring it and boot. I also use uh, QMU a lot, Joel, for the same reasons you mentioned. I have right. more control. What I do use, though, I use Word um, SH front end for QMU so that I can yeah. manage them and the, keep those around. Um, okay. keep the uh, virtual machines around for me to play with. And then I can uh, create different so, uh, virtual machines yeah. to kick off okay. and then compare them. I see. Can you, Ver, uh, can you use Verisage if you don't uh, you if you don't use libvirt to boot Q, uh, to boot the VM? Uh, or like if you I, use QMU and then can you use Verisage after that if you use QMU directly? That, yeah, no. Well, let me see. You can't. You can't. Yeah, okay. it's one. So, but uh, yeah, I, I kind of go back and forth. I do use in some cases, I keep the uh, live word and uh, word, uh, word and so that I can keep them around so that I can play with uh, different options, say different uh, uh, configuration options or whatnot, so that I have I have something to go back to. Um, you could do it uh, man manually managing QMU images as well, but what will allow you to save yeah. uh, uh, when you if you figured out all of the options that you want to enable, you can just save them and then kick the virtual machine off instead of, instead of remem remembering all of that. So just... okay, I see. Yeah, definitely worth checking out. Right. So let me see. There is one question um, earlier about. Uh, process, uh, dead process stack. Um, is there a way to, let me read the question. Is there a way to, uh, way we can get dead process stack messages as part of FCRACE or kernel logs instead of using PS dash AUX and then grabbing the PID and then going and looking under yeah. a slash problem? There is actually a SysRQ option to dump all of the stacks of even of processes that are not running um uh, so check that out i don't know off the top of my head what the sysrq option is but that's another thing like you can use to see if like okay what are all the tasks on the system blo blocked on doing like is it a few text or something else is it some kind of io request um another thing you could do is you could pass uh the panic option to the kernel and it will dump many different useful things when a panic happens uh, like it can dump like the locks that are held. And one of the things I believe that it dumps is also the stacks of all the tasks in the system. Um, another way to get the stacks is actually through uh, uh, Crash. So Crash is basically this tool that can an analyze kernel core dumps. And uh, you can collect a core dump using KXSEC uh, KDump that mechanism, or actually you can connect, connect, a, collect a core dump using QMU directly and then pass that to crash and collect the stacks that way as well. I've not personally done that and I have to do that for myself, but that's another way to collect a core dump and get the stacks. I know people who do that, sure. We are, we are out of time. Um, okay. There is one question about um, production system debug. I think Joel already addressed that. Really with the production systems, you have to um, you have to figure out what's the uh, a simple uh, way to de uh, recreate the problem, reproduce the problem. That's what I do. I ask for a, what is the minimal things that you can do to debug? And then gathering the logs in the field and asking for the logs, all of those. Stress NG is a different tool. Um, it's not, it can be used for debugging, but it's a, it's more of a testing tool than debugging tool. It can stress the system. Um, so those are the questions that were there, um, Joel. Right. Uh, what, what is the good part, the good tool apart from stress NG? And I'm guessing it's for a stressing the system. So that those are more stressing and stress testing tools like Sysbot and yeah. such and fuzzy. Yeah, All I right. think uh, mm -hmm. the LPP project also has a lot of test uh, unit tests and stuff. And of course, case of tests has uh, the case of tests that Shua maintains has a lot of good stuff that uh, we use a lot to test the kernel as well. Um, right. 
Yeah. And K unit is another one as well. K unit, yeah. So, all right. Sorry, uh, we are two minutes past. Candice, um, how are we doing? Um, yeah, I can wrap up. Or if you guys have any other questions you want to answer, um, we can hang on for a few extra minutes. Totally up to you. Don't think so. Thank you, sir. Flo um, coming in, uh, Joel. Thank you yep, so much. Absolutely. I hope it was helpful. And thank you very much. See you next time. Awesome. Bye. Thank you, Joel and Shua, for your time today, and thank you, everyone, for joining us. As a reminder, this recording will be on the Linux Foundation's YouTube page later today, and a copy of the presentation slides will be added to the Linux Foundation website. We hope you join us for future mentorship sessions. Have a wonderful day.